Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Come on, you can get more excited than that. It's beautiful outside. Now listen, I know on the video they welcomed everybody, but they didn't get to hear us clap for them. So can you just clap for Cape Coral, Dixon and Hardy, everybody online, and clap for yourselves here too for coming here. So thank you so much. And as the video said, we're wrapping up this amazing series called Summer of Soul. And let me just remind you, in case you missed any of the messages, what they've been about. So Pastor Lisa kicked us off that first week talking about peace. And then last week, if you remember, she talked about courage. Two amazing messages. Don't, don't miss those. Go back and watch those. Then week two was about family. And if you remember, we did a tag team with Pastor Lance and Pastor Cam and Adam and Lisa, just really talking about purpose and family and what that does. And then finally, Pastor Jeremy talked about Remain in Me. Four amazing messages. If you have not watched them or want to go back and watch them, I would ask you to do that on the brand new app that we just launched today. So make sure you check that out. But today we are talking about a final subject here, and we're going to really center in on the soul. And we find that God actually talks about the soul in 3 John verse 2. And it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper. Now let me just pause here, because a lot of people have problems with this word prosper. This does not mean that God makes everyone a millionaire. Can we just agree on that, all right? This word prosper, actually I was trying to think of a picture and if you were here last week and you heard Pastor Lisa's message, she talked about going down that slide at Magic Waters or whatever it's called now. It used to be Magic Waters. Pastor Lisa, I would never go down that slide, by the way. That was very courageous of you. But that's a picture of prosperity. God rushes us forward. That's what that word means. He rushes us forward. It's nothing that we do. We just have to take a step in faith and he rushes us forward. That's what that word means. So I want you to listen to what he wants to prosper. He says, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now, how many people in here want God to rush our soul forward and prosper our soul, right? I think all of us would sign up for that. Even though I would not go down that slide, I want God to prosper my soul, okay? But listen, a soul can be confusing sometimes. And the word soul, and you may want to write this down as you think about it over this next week, the word soul actually means your mind your will, and your emotions. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. A lot of people talk about this as your inner self or who you actually are, but your mind, your will, and your emotions. And if we actually drill down even further, you could say that our thoughts and our words make up a huge part of our soul. Our thoughts and our words make up a huge part of who we are, of our soul. And God talks about our thoughts and our words throughout all of Scripture. And I'm going to give you a couple here, but you could find many, many more verses on this. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, we've all heard this scripture before, if you've been in church for any time, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But I want you to think about this. What this means is your life moves in the direction of your most dominant thought. So that can be scary for some of us and exciting for others, right? But God says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's how important God thinks our thoughts are. Let's look at Romans 12 too. This is the New Living Translation. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Now, some, of the, some versions say renew your mind, but this is saying, I want to change the way you think and listen to what happens when we change the way we think. Then you will learn God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God says, if you let me change your thoughts, if you take the step and go down the slide and let me prosper your soul, I will show you my good and perfect and pleasing will for you. Just let me change your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, I know we, hear, we have heard this verse before too, but this is actually talking, this is an army term of bringing someone captive. If you're in the army and you're taking someone captive, you're not just going to say, hey, you mind coming with me? Can you, we're going to capture you. You mind coming with me? No, you take it by force. And that's what God's saying. Your thoughts are so important. Your life moves in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. It's so important that I want you to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So can we agree that God says that our thoughts are important? Now let's look at our words. 
Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of our tongue. Now, I've heard this scripture a lot growing up. I've been in the church literally my whole life. I don't know that we really believe this verse. If you think about it, death, that's the end of everything. And life, that's the start of everything. God says death and life are in the power of your tongue, of simply the words that you say, that's how much power your tongue has. Matthew 12, 36 and 37 in the Amplified says, but I tell you on the day of judgment, people will have to give an account for every careless and useless word that you speak. Now I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but how many of us have said anything careless or anything useless? I'm not even gonna say in our life. How about this week? How about today, right? God says, I'm writing down all your careless and useless words. That's how important he thinks our words are. And then verse 37 says, for by your words you will be justified and acquitted of the guilt of your sin, and by your words you will be condemned and sentenced. So listen, we can do a whole message and really a whole series on our thoughts and our words. But remember, we go back to 3 John 2 that says he wants to prosper our soul. And our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And if we drill down, that's our thoughts and our words. So I want you to think about this statement. Because this is the groundwork for everything we're going to talk about today. Everybody ready? I want you to think about this. Maybe jot this down, whatever you want. Your life today is a result of the thoughts you have allowed and the words you have spoken. So your life today, where you're at right now in your life, is a result of the thoughts you have allowed and the words you have spoken. Now to some of us, you might say, Derek, I'm living the dream. I love my life. That must mean that God has maybe worked on you and your thoughts and your words. But other people may say, Derek, sometimes I feel like I'm living a nightmare. Right? And I'm not saying there aren't other things, but what I'm telling you is God says that your thoughts and your words are so important that life and death are in them. That are where you are today is a result of the thoughts you have allowed and the words you have spoken. And I think if all of us were honest with ourselves, we would say we all have thoughts that we're not proud of, and we all have words that we're not proud of. And these words and thoughts that we have not dealt with in our past fall under a category of what I call inner vows. I'd like you to write that phrase down, inner vows. Now, when I heard this phrase a couple years ago, here was my first thought. I've never heard of an inner vow. So if I've never heard of it, I must not have it. So great, I'm done. I'm just going to check out of the message. Little did I know that that message would be one of the most transformational messages that I ever heard. Because as I began to pray about inner vows, God began to show me, oh yeah, you have this one, and you have this one, and you have this one, and the list goes on and on and on. So here's my ask of you. Even if you've never heard of an inner vow, don't check out, but lean in. Because I'm telling you, this subject, even though you may not have heard of it, I would bet to say at least 99%, and I'm even going to stretch it out to 100% of us in this room, have at least made one inner vow in our life. And I believe these are thoughts and words that have not been dealt with, and God says, listen, if I'm going to prosper your soul, I want to deal with this in your life. Here's the other thing I'm asking from you is to lean in, but also don't listen for someone else. The tendency in this message is to say, man, I really wish so-and-so heard this message. In fact, I'm going to send it to him. And you can send it to him. Let him get on the new app. But please listen for yourself. Because it's so easy to say, so-and-so really needs to hear this. So the title of today's message is The Path of Inner Vows. Because it is a path, and I'm going to show you what that path looks like. So what is an inner vow? Let's just define it. An inner vow is a self-directed, and self-focused, I want you to notice those two phrases, self-directed and self-focused promise that we make to ourselves in response to difficulty, frustration, or pain. Okay, I'm going to read this again. It's an inner vow as a self-directed and self-focused. All of it is on us. It's a promise we make ourselves in response to difficulty, frustration, or pain. See, here's what happens. There's a painful event that happens right here. And it's so painful, we say to ourselves, we promise ourselves, 
this was so painful, I'm never coming back here. I'm never going to go back to this moment because it was so painful. And let me just be clear, it just has to be painful to you. Because some of the things we're going to bring up today, you might think, well, that's really dumb. Why would anybody be pain? Why would that hurt anybody? Or why would that cause frustration? If it's painful to you, you possibly made an inner vow, a self-directed and self-focused promise to yourself. It literally is a contract that we sign with ourselves. We are the only one that's signing this contract. And what we're doing is it's a defense mechanism. We say this to comfort ourselves. We say, you know what, self, I know this was painful, but don't worry. We've signed a contract with ourselves that we're never going back to that moment. So you don't have to worry about it. We've drawn a line in the sand, and we're never going back to that moment. So take comfort, self. We're not going back there. And what you really say is, I will never allow this to happen again. And I'm going to give you some examples. And when I begin to read some examples, you're going to start to think, yeah, I maybe said that. But what I want you to be thinking about as I read some of these examples is be thinking about a painful moment, a difficult moment, a frustrating moment. Maybe it was one that you had an unmet expectation or an unmet need. And it was so painful that you said, I will never go back here. Because most of the time, inner vows have two words involved. Always and never. Always and never. And all inner vows start with I. Remember I said that you sign a contract with yourself? You are the only one on this contract. See, God's not signing this contract. You are signing it and you, will, you say, I will never or I will always. Let me give you some examples here. When I grow up, no one is ever going to tell me what to do. Your laughter tells me that you may have said that. All right, let's go on. I will never trust a man again. Or I'll never trust a woman again. I will never get married. I will never get divorced. I will never have kids. When I grow up, I will never discipline my kids. I'll never fly in an airplane. I'll never fall in love again. I will never let anyone hurt me or get close to me. I will never be poor. I will always be rich. I will never go to church when I grow up. I will never give to the church or trust them with my money. Pastors can't be trusted. I will never trust God again. I'll never be emotional or lose control of my emotions. I'll never be like my mother. I will never be like my father. I'll never be an alcoholic. I will never be overweight. I will always take care of myself. I'm looking out for me. I will always take care of myself. Or I will always protect my children. Now, a couple of those, you may think to yourself, well, Derek, like the last one, I'll always protect my children. Isn't that a positive thing? Or even, I will never get divorced. Doesn't God say he doesn't want people to get divorced? And let me be very clear about something. Inner vows are a promise you make to yourself in the midst of pain to protect yourself from going back. These are not things to say, God, I don't really want to get divorced. Will you help me? Will you help me not get divorced? Will you bless my marriage? Or with with your children, you say, God... You are in charge of my children. I'm praying that you protect them. See, that's different. That's a different goal. And some of these may come across as positive. What I'm talking about is in the midst of pain, you promise yourself we're never going back here. I'm taking control and we will never go back to this spot. Do you see the difference? Because see, here's what happens. Like let's say if you had a painful moment, your father abused you, maybe physically or verbally. You say, I will never let a man tell me what to do. Now, number one, you're making a promise and you're taking control of that. But what you've done is you've actually judged your father in that moment. See, a lot of times in pain, we judge people for what they just did to us or for what they did to other people. But what does Matthew 7 say about judging? When you judge 
you will be judged. To the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. See, many of these inner vows come in pain and they are connected with a judgment towards someone else. Now, I'm not here to downplay the pain that you went through. If you were abused uh, verbally or physically, I know that was painful and I am sorry that those things happened. But can I tell you that when these things happen, it is a trap from the enemy to get you to make an inner vow and to judge someone else. Proverbs 20 verse 25 says, it's a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later consider one's vow. See, I believe that in pain, the enemy comes and says, God's not with you, by the way. And you better, ne- you better never allow this to happen again. And in fact, God must not care about you, so you need to sign a contract with yourself to say you're never going back because God's going to allow you to go back again and again to this pain. And see, God says, no, no, no. I want you to know I am here with you wherever you go. And God is the only one that can heal you from this inner vow. Now listen, I want you to know that some of these things that I read off were pretty serious. But some of them actually are somewhat funny, but can still affect your life. In fact, as I was researching this, I heard a story about a pastor who had a friend. And he said, I went over there and every time I took a drink of pop, he came and poured, made sure my glass was full. And I looked in his cabinet and he had pop stacked to the ceiling. He said, this is the most carbonated and caffeinated family I'd ever met in my life. And he said it later came out, they went to the grocery store, this friend of his and his wife went to the grocery store, and he was throwing cases of pop in the grocery cart. And she said, Tom, don't you think that's enough? He said, don't ever tell me it's enough. I will decide what pop, how much pop is enough. Well, come to find out, his mom and dad did not allow him to have pop in the home at all when he was growing up. And you know what he said? When I grow up, we'll always have pop in my house. Now, I want you to think that might seem like something foolish, but can I tell you, it affected his marriage, right? Because a lot of times when we have these inner vows, we're a little bit crazy in these areas when it happens, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Pastor Jimmy Evans, who wrote a book about this, here's his quote about inner vows. He said, when it comes to a person doing what they're going to do with their life, it typically comes down to their priorities and their values. Now, listen to this last line. Inner vows are the highest level of commitment for most people. When you make an inner vow, you're signing a contract with yourself, you're making a promise to yourself. See, we can break promises to other people. That's not really affecting us. But when we make a promise to ourselves, we don't break that promise. And now we have put our goals ahead of God. So before I tell you some of the dangers of inner vows... Let me explain one that I have in my life. Can I, just, can I be a little vulnerable here with you? When I grew up, when I was eight years old in 1984, I grew up a Cubs fan. Now, I know you're going to feel sorry for me. Some people clapping, maybe one or two. It's been a tough run, all right? I know some of you have been Cubs fans longer than I have, but my brother was actually, he was a Cardinals fan. I think I chose wrong. I don't know. I wish I could go back and make that decision again, but either way, I was a huge Cubs fan. And in 1984, I was eight years old, the Cubs were in the National League Championship Series, and they were supposed to go to the World Series, right? And we know that that never happened. Well, 32 years later, it happened, right? But they were supposed to go, and they were playing the Padres. And I remember I was laying in bed, and I could not sleep. I wanted the Cubs to win so bad. I thought, oh, come on, this is the last game. They've got to win. And I couldn't sleep. So I called my mom and my dad into the room. I said, can you allow me to just stay up and watch the game? So they said, all right, fine. You can go in our bedroom and watch the game. And if you ask my wife, she'll tell you, I have very little memories of my childhood. I don't know why. I don't remember much. But I remember this moment like I was still sitting there. And I was sitting on my mom and dad's bed watching the Cubs. And in fact, let me show you what I watched a little bit of that night in my mom and dad's room. I can't believe it's Brewster. I got up along with him. Brown ball hit the dirt, right through his leg! Here comes Martinez, we're tied at three! Anything to get on, put the bat on the ball for a single to left field. Hard, Sandberg over his head, a right center field base hit! One run will score! Mullen is slow getting it, here comes Wiggins! Here comes the front of the play, he's sick! Drink the champagne, and it's not good enough, you come back next year. That's it, deep center field, you're near a long way. Still going back. He can't get it high off the wall. Bounces. Just play one game. Is it fair? Off the hand. Steadles will go the short way. And then there were none. The Padres have won it all. 
almost painful watching, isn't it? It's painful. And as an eight-year-old boy, I sat there and watched this. And I said to myself, this is the first inner vow that I could ever remember. And remember, it only has to be painful to you, right? This might not be painful to you watching the Cubs, but it was painful to me as an eight-year-old boy watching my favorite team collapse like we just watched on there. And I said to myself, I will never allow myself to lose because someone else outworked me. And I will tell you that that evening changed literally the rest of my life. Because after that, I was a different person. And in fact, some people would call me a little weird when I was a kid, and they might still call me weird, I don't know, but I never played video games, I never played with toys, all I did was practice. All I did was practice. I practiced baseball, I practiced basketball, and if I lost, I was a little crazy in that area. I would lose my mind a little bit. In fact, I hear Carrie laughing over here. Carrie and I dated in high school, and she broke up with me. That's a whole other story for another day. But she said, Derek, I'm not even in your top five of priorities. You've got God. You've got basketball. You've got all these things. Why bother even dating you? I'm not even in your top five priorities. All you care about is getting better. And you know what? She was right. And it was because I made that inner vow that night that I will never allow myself to lose because somebody else worked harder than me. So let's fast forward to 1996. I was playing college basketball and we lost a game we shouldn't have lost. I grabbed my bag, I jumped in my car and I drove to a hotel, didn't tell anybody where I was going, and I sat and just cried. I was just angry at God. We lost a basketball game, by the way. Did I mention that to you? It's not that big of a deal. You get a little crazy in these areas when you've made an inner vow and something triggers that. You get a little crazy in your response. So here I am sitting in a hotel room all night. Nobody knows where I am. My roommates don't know where I am. There's no cell phones in 1996. They may be called the police. I don't even know. But I literally went by myself because we lost a game because I had felt like I broke the inner vow that I made to myself. Now, I didn't think about that at that time. I later realized what happened there. But I'm telling you, these inner vows affect us even if we don't realize it. Fast forward to 2002. I was uh, at, working at Chase Bank over here on North Main, and I got a call. I remember exactly where I was, down in the lunchroom. And the regional manager called me and said, Derek, I'd like to offer you another job. Um, I don't think you're going to succeed. Uh, you don't have the talent or the ability to succeed or the background. Uh, but Jim and Mike think you can do okay, so I'm going to hire you but uh, I don't think you're going to do well. Would you like to take the job? <laughs> That's a great moment, a great moment for me. Um, but in that moment, that inner vow came up again. And in fact, on top of my inner vow that said I will never allow anyone to beat me because they outworked me, I made another inner vow that, night, that day, and I said, I'm going to make you a liar. I'm going to make you a liar and show you that I'm going to outwork everybody to make sure that I succeed. And you know what happened in that moment when Steve called me and offered that job? Because I made another inner vow on top of the one I had already made, I allowed bitterness to start stirring in my heart. I allowed judgment on him. I allowed anger. I allowed hatred. I later had to apologize to Steve. He doesn't even remember saying that to me, which I'm somewhat grateful for. But for the next eight years... That day drove me because I made another inner vow on top of what I had already said. And I said, I will outwork every single person to make sure that I don't lose. That's how it's affected, affected me in my life. And it's taken God a long time to heal, to number one, show me, and number two, heal me from this. But can I just let you know that when you make an inner vow, that contract you're signing, God's signature is not on that contract. See, God has a different plan, and again, he was there in the pain with you. Don't allow the enemy to trap you and say he wasn't there, and he'll never be there for you again. And see, what happens is when we make this inner vow, we actually build a wall. And these inner vows, we make a wall to protect ourselves. See, we think that this contract with ourselves is going to say, okay, I never want to go back to that painful moment again. So to make sure we never go back, I'm going to build a wall and make a vow to myself to protect myself. 
Doesn't it feel comfortable in here? It just feels so safe in here, right? This is my protection to make sure that that never happens again. But can I tell you something from experience? This protection becomes a prison in your life. See, we think that this is protecting us, but no, no, no. This is isolating us from God doing his best in our life. And we have one, ball, one wall up here today, but can I tell you that as you go through this, you might have five, 10, 15 different walls you have built to protect yourself. And just like in that situation where the, I made the inner vow and let's say at that college basketball game when we lost, I said, wait, this is painful. Losing is painful. I better run to my wall and make sure that I go to my protection. This was me sitting in the hotel room. God, you left me. Why weren't you there? We lost. I promised myself we wouldn't lose. And see, this protection that I thought was protecting us, pr protecting me, became a prison that triggered me every time something happened. And I want you to write this phrase down because this phrase will summarize everything that we're talking about today. So if someone says, hey, what was the message about today? This is the phrase I want you to think about. Are you ready? You can take a picture up on the screen or write it down. When you vow... You allow the pain to remain. When you vow, you allow the pain to remain. Because see, here's what happens. We draw that line in the sand. We sign a contract with ourselves. And God, I believe, is coming to us saying, I want to heal you of that. But you've made an inner vow. You've already said, nope, here's my protection. I don't need you to protect me in that area because I don't think you were there so now I'm protecting myself. See, when you vow, you allow the pain to remain because we are now isolating ourselves from others and from God. You literally become unteachable in this area. So here's a couple ways you can think about, do I have inner vows? Number one, think about painful situations, difficulties, hurt. You may have made an inner vow at that time. But the second thing, and maybe ask your spouse or a close friend, what areas am I a little crazy in? What areas am I unteachable in? Because can I tell you, most likely you made an inner vow at some point, and you said, you know what, you can teach me up to here, but you're not going to go beyond that. Matthew 5, verse 34 and 37 says, but I say, do not make any vows. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. And listen to this verse, verse 37. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. God says this is evil for you to make a vow. And it's evil because he is no longer Lord of that area. See, if you said, you know what, I'm never going to be poor again. Let's say you grew up in abject poverty as a kid. And you saw the pain. And you said, I will never be poor again. Guess who's not Lord of your finances? See, that sounds like a positive statement, right? But it's judging your parents. And it might even be judging God for not providing. Or your perception that he did not provide. Let's say you, you say to yourself, I'll never discipline my children. Let's say your parents discipline you harshly. When I get older... I'll never discipline my children. Guess who's not Lord of your family? I will never allow my spouse to control me or tell me what to do. Guess who's no longer Lord of your marriage? See, some of these things sound positive, but it takes the Lord off of the throne and says, I don't need you in this area because I've already got my protection. But remember, the protection becomes a prison because God's whole goal is that you end up depending on him. That's his whole goal. He says, listen, I want you to depend on me. No matter if it's painful or not, I want you to depend on me for everything. Because what really happens when we make an inner vow is our relationships become counterfeit. Did you hear what I said? Our relationships become counterfeit because, listen, somebody might try to get close to us and we allow them to get close to a certain point but they're not coming in here. See, we allow them to get close, but we say, hey, hey, close enough. I told, I promised myself I would not let my spouse control me or tell me what to do. You're close enough. I'm not going to allow you to do that. 
And in painful moments, we run here and it makes our relationships with other people counterfeit. But can I tell you, it also makes your relationship with God not 100% genuine. Because again, he's not Lord in that area. And that is the danger of the path of inner vows. We have taken him off the throne. Now here's the good news. We're going to put this up on the screen because I think this is a powerful phrase. It's not done until it's good. I heard this phrase a couple weeks ago. God says he makes everything good. So can I tell you that even if you have inner vows coming up in your mind right now, it's not done until it's good. Because God says, I want to turn that pain into a testimony. I want to turn what you went through, the inner vow that you made, and I want you to tell people, hey, listen, I made a mistake, I made an inner vow, but God turned me around and he changed me. Here's my testimony. It's not done until it's good. So if you feel like you've made inner vows, it's okay. We all have. Everyone in this room has made an inner vow at some point, but God says it's not done until I make it good. So let's allow him to make it good. So here's how we change this. Number one, we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what inner vows we've made. And again, I don't want you to think about, all right, just what, what was it? What was the one thing? I, I may have read one off, and you may have thought, yep, that was me. But can I tell you, there's lots of things that were painful to you that no one else would think was painful, but you made an inner vow at that moment. Allow the Holy Spirit to show you what those moments were. And what a great time to do it in the 21 days of prayer that is coming up. Right? What a great time to spend and just ask the Holy Spirit one simple question. Will you show me any inner vows that I've made? That's step number one. Step number two is say, God, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me for building this wall of protection and not allowing you to protect me? God, will you forgive me? That's step number two. And then step number three is to forgive the people that cause the pain. Right? Because remember, when pain comes, many times there's someone else involved and we judge that person. And God says when you judge that person, it comes back on you. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. But it's in the negative, right? So we need to forgive the people that hurt us. And again, I don't want to downplay any of the pain that you went through. I know there are painful stories in this room. But God asks us to forgive them and allow him to be the one that is our protection. So ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Ask God to forgive you and forgive other people. And we've actually built some time into the service to do this. So I'd ask everyone to please not leave unless you, it's an absolute emergency, but we're gonna take about 30 seconds. And they're just gonna play behind us. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, will you reveal to me any inner vows? And then I'm going to pray a prayer that we're going to have up on the screen or in the app that you can actually pray this week as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal some of these to you. So let's just take about 30 seconds. Again, please don't leave unless it's an absolute emergency, but just take 30 seconds and just pray that simple prayer. Holy Spirit, will you show me any inner vows that I've made? As the Holy Spirit begins to reveal some of these to you, now we're over the next 21 days. Again, the prayer I'm going to read, there's nothing special about the prayer. It's just giving you an idea or a sample of what that prayer might look like to ask God to forgive you. And again, it's going to be up on the screen. It'll be in the app as well. But it says, Lord, I acknowledge the legitimate needs and desires that these vows are attempting to care for. And I realized that I was trying in my own effort to control my life to protect myself or get revenge, and I choose now to break these inner vows. In the name of Jesus, I confess the inner vow to never allow anyone to beat me because they outworked me. 
I ask you to forgive me for making and holding these vows, and I repent of making and holding these vows. And I renounce these now in the name of Jesus. Now again, there's nothing special about this prayer. It's a simple guide for you this week. But I would encourage you, ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Ask God to forgive you with a sample prayer like this and forgive others. Because I'm here to tell you, God wants your soul to prosper. He wants to rush you forward. And when we build this wall, we are not allowing him to do what he can do, which is the supernatural. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've been encouraged today. We say this all the time. We're not just a friendly church, but a family church. And we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer for anything, we would love to come alongside you and pray with you. Simply visit our app and tap the Get Connected button. You'll also find resources on how you can take your next steps in your faith journey. Here at City First Church, we are passionate about generosity. And when we give, we are able to impact people globally in Jesus' name, bringing practical help and hope. If you were encouraged today, we would invite you to partner with us financially and give back to God through City First Church. Giving is simple. Click the link in the description or head on over to the app. We are so grateful for your generosity. Lastly, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again for tuning in here at City First Church. We'll see you next time.